Like Keats, Lamb was a writer defined by melancholy. Melancholy during the Romantic Age had a very clear history behind it. And it's worth looking into this history, albeit briefly, as a context to understand Lamb's embrace of melancholy as the primary mood of his essays, and also uh, Keats's own uh, melancholy disposition in his odes, primarily Ode on Melancholy. Until the late 15th century, melancholy was seen in the European world as a negative disposition. The word melancholy simply means black bile, and it comes from an ancient theory of medicine that thrived in the days of ancient Greece um, in medical thinkers like Galen and um, Hippocrates, uh, and a theory suggesting that we are made, all of us, of four different fluids or humors. Uh, there is the humor of melancholy or black bile, uh, there's the sanguine humor associated with blood. There's the uh, phlegmatic humor um, suggesting, I guess, uh, snot, um, mucus. And there is the caloric humor, uh, yellow bile, which suggests, um, well, um, bile. Now, each of these four humors bore with it not only a physiological quality, but also a psychological quality. So black bile, as we know, was associated with melancholy, um, gloominess, what we would call depression, uh, cynicism, doubt. The sanguine humor was associated with optimism, exuberance, vitality. The phlegmatic humor was associated with uh, lethargy, uh, calm, laziness, lack of ambition or motivation, and the caloric humor, yellow bile, was associated with bitterness, um, contempt, mean-spiritedness, um, irascibility. So the idea was that each of us has all four of these humors, but we have one reigning humor that defines who we are. This is an ancient theory of genetics when it comes to the shaping of personality. So if you were born with sanguine temperament leading, you were optimistic, that was fairly positive. If you were born with the phlegmatic, uh, you were calm, tranquil, uh, positive. If you were born with the um, caloric, well, not as positive, you're more likely to be irascible. But if you're born with the melancholy humor ruling your personality, well, that's bad news, at least in the ancient world. Um, of all the four humors, this was seen in the most negative light. And this continued into the European Middle Ages, where the melancholy disposition was associated with, with not only a gloomy personality, but also the propensity to lie, uh, also the propensity to have uh, really horrible dreams and possibly open yourself to being possessed by a demon in the middle of the night. Uh, and also, melancholy was associated with um, Acadia, uh, a, a feeling of, of malaise, the noonday demon it was called, that often beset nuns and monks and the nunneries and monasteries. But what happens? When Marcelo Ficino comes along in uh, the late 1500s, he says, look, I was born under the sign of Saturn. Saturn is the most melancholy planet. I myself am melancholy. But you know what? My melancholia has actually been useful for my vocation as a philosopher. Because I'm melancholy, um, I tend to be gloomy, yes, but I tend to be contemplative. And I tend to stay up late and read and think. Is this such a bad thing? No, my melancholy has inspired me to think deeply about matters. Moreover, as a melancholy person, I simply don't embrace the world as it is. I question the world as it is. Um, I'm often wondering if the world can be better. Um, I'm often asking, why is the world so bad? So this critical faculty that can be associated with melancholy, well, it's valuable for a philosopher as well. And also, as, as a melancholy person, I'm constantly imagining how the world can be better. What can I do to make the world better? So imagination can also um, emerge from melancholy. So contemplation, criticism, imagination, these three qualities can be associated with melancholy. 
So what happens in the early modern period, there's a renaissance of melancholy as the best of the four humors because it's associated with intelligence, wit, imagination. And we see this most markedly in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, where Hamlet is thoroughly melancholy. Um, he wears black. He is constantly uh, sighing. He enters into these soliloquies where he complains about the nature of the world. But his melancholy is inseparable from his verbal pyrotechnics and his very active imagination. Some years after Hamlet, um, a writer named Robert Burton wrote Anatomy of Melancholy, a very long book, where he looks at the melancholy mood from all sorts of different angles. Angle of religion, philosophy, mythology, literature, personal experience, so on and so forth. And this book became sort of a handbook uh, that again extolled melancholy not as a mark of sickness, uh, but as a possible virtue if, if, if um, used properly. Well, in the so-called Romantic Age, um, we see writers like Keats, um, also I would say writers like Coleridge and, and writers like Shelley and Byron reaching back to this, this idea of noble melancholy. Hamlet was such an important hero for the Romantic Age, um, Coleridge in particular, who in his lecture on Shakespeare's Hamlet said, I have the smack of Hamlet um, in, in me. I am a melancholy hero like Hamlet. Well, Lamb was deeply immersed in the literature of the 1600s and 1700s in England. He knew Burton very well. In fact, in some early pieces, he tried to pass himself off as Robert Burton. He wrote these extracts and pretended as though he had found them, these unpublished extracts from, from Robert Burton. So he knew the tradition of noble, noble melancholy very well. Now, Lamb himself was melancholy in disposition. We would probably say he was clinically depressed. As I said earlier, or in another lecture, he spent some time in a madhouse um, when he was a young man. Uh, he was prone to deep fits of depression. He was an alcoholic. Of course, his sister Mary had serious mental illness. So, so Lamb was already of a dark turn just in his daily life. But in constructing his literary persona in the famous London magazine pieces, Eliah, um, he gives almost all of his essays a, a tinge of, of gentle melancholy. Uh, again, probably valuing melancholy as a spur to imagination, um, as a spur to uh, the critical faculty, as a spur to contemplation. So if you read essays like uh, New Year's Eve or Dream Children, A Reverie, or Oxford in the Vacation, um, um, or, or um, his essay on, on chimney sweepers, his essay on his first play. Um, in these and so many more essays, there's a kind of wistfulness. There's a sense that the world's not like we want it to be. There's a gap between what we want and what is. Uh, what we pine for, we will never get. Now you can say this is grim, and it does suggest a kind of ongoing cynicism. Life is not what we want it to be. But what does this do for Lamb? This gap between expectation and reality generates his meditation on the nature of life and often is amused for his comedy. If the world is indeed a melancholy place where we don't get where we want and, and where all the great things die, um, then we can be bitter about it, go into the caloric mode, or we can be kind of gently comical about it. And, and, and laugh at our failed efforts to get what we want. To be a failure is to be a realist. And to realize that you're a failure um, is kind of funny um, because you're constantly aspiring for what you can't get. So as you read through the Lamb essays, pay attention to that, that elegiac, wistful, melancholy sensibility and know that, that Lamb is, is not only expressing his own existential depression, uh, but also he's inflecting, as Keats did too, this, this, this rather uh, detailed tradition of noble melancholy.